Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Fair Housing Insiders. This is episode 51, and in just a moment, I'm going to welcome another very special guest to our program today. We're looking forward to hearing from her about source of income. But just as a quick reminder, if you haven't done so already, please subscribe to our, our newsletter, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and you can also uh, follow us on Instagram at, at Fair Housing Institute, where we post a lot of other fair housing tips and other content related to that. So uh, be sure to connect with us on those channels. So let's uh, welcome uh, to our show today, Terry Kate from Baker Donaldson, Beerman, Caldwell, Caldwell and Berkowitz. Uh, so Terry, welcome to the show. It's uh, so nice to have you and you're a partner with the firm. So we really, really appreciate having you with us today. Thanks very much, Jonathan. I'm glad to be here. I appreciate the invitation. Yeah. I'm going to talk today about source of income discrimination. If you're ready for me to get started. Go for it. Give us, give us the overview. I know, you okay. know, just in, in prepping for this show was you mentioned something that was interesting, how source of income, what it's actually related to, and it's not so much on a federal level. So yeah, give us an overview on source of income and what we're going to be talking about today, please. Sure. Source of income is a, an additional protected class in housing discrimination, but it's not part of the Federal Fair Housing Act. So in other words, discrimination based on your source of income is not a federal issue, issue at all. It is a very common additional added protected class under state and local fair housing laws and ordinances. So if you are in California, if you are in the Northeast, if you are in certain counties in Florida, if you are in the state of Texas, you need to know about whether source of income is something that you need to be concerned about in terms of accepting applicants and, uh, for housing and, and qualifying people for housing. So what source of income means is, it is, if it is a protected class, it means you can't discriminate against somebody, you can't treat them differently, you can't refuse to rent to them because they intend to pay for housing with any particular lawful source of income. That's the broad definition. It, it covers any lawful source of income. So for instance, if source of income is a protected class, you would not be allowed to say, I don't wanna rent to anyone who's a lawyer, which I hear all the time. <laughs> um, it's perfectly legal under the Fair Housing Act because source of income is not protected. But if you are in, for instance, the state of California that says you cannot discriminate based on source of income, somebody who earns their lawful income by being a lawyer cannot be discriminated against based on that fact. So that's what source of income discrimination means. But of course, it's typically and most often used with regard to rental assistance programs, people who receive housing subsidies, most commonly, of course, is the so-called Section 8 program. And what happens with source of income, with it being protected, the Section 8 program becomes mandatory. You can't refuse to consider somebody's application just because they intend to pay for their housing with, for instance, Section 8 housing voucher or other kinds of governmental rental assistance. Um, there's you know, a number of different programs for rental assistance, but you can't simply say, no, we don't accept third party payments. That's not uh, that would not be allowed if source of income is a protected class. Very good. That's a nice, nice overview. Appreciate you kind of highlighting some examples too from across the country. And um, I meant to ask this at the outset, how many years have you been practicing, uh, practicing law when it comes to fair housing? I know it's been a fair bit, right? <laughs> Over 30 years. Yeah. Yeah. So, wow. That's an amazing amount of experience. And I'm sure you've seen a lot of things change uh, over the years when it comes to this particular and um, you know with this topic and how it's changed in different parts of the country well there's always it seems like there's always something pending in congress right. on the federal level to add source of income as a protected class to the fair housing act but it hasn't passed yet right right yeah it keeps you it, uh, it keeps you hopping just to see what's what's coming down the pipeline for for changes in laws and so forth so again, thank you for being on the show. This is going to be an awesome conversation. So um, any other details? I know you kind of highlighted um, specifically, you know, what the overview of source of income, any other uh, 
besides state or, or uh, anything else that you can share on who needs to be paying attention to this, like from a property management level? Who Sure. Yeah. Regardless of where you're located, if you operate a federally assisted housing program, um, you know, a 202, an 811, um, or if you have a tax credit property, typically you are not permitted to refuse to accept a Section 8 voucher um, for an otherwise qualified applicant. So while source of income may not be a protected class in your jurisdiction, um, if the participation in those programs makes it mandatory, makes the Section 8 program mandatory for you. Now, that doesn't mean that source of income in general is protected. You could mm -hmm. probably still have that prohibition against lawyers if you wanted to. Um, but you would be required to accept the Section 8 assistance uh, as part of part of the income that is considered to qualify somebody. Very good. Okay. So it is. It does, it does cover a, a lot of scenarios. So that, thank you for, for highlighting that. We have a pretty big audience that listen to this show. So, uh, you know, sometimes we hear from, from students, you know, how does that apply to me? You know, I'm in this type of property or I'm in this type of property, but, you know, who knows, you may be in a type of property today, but that doesn't mean where, you know, with the, how much things change with portfolios, what you might be in tomorrow. So this is valuable information for everyone in our community to pay attention to. So you're prepared. If you're in that situation right now that your property is subject to that or in the future. So thank you, Terry. That was great. Yeah. I, I think as with any issue um, with regard to housing discrimination, you always have to be aware of where you are, you know, mm -hmm. what are your state and local laws, because it's not enough just to know the federal law. And um, you also need to know how the property that you, the community that you're working with, how it's funded, because that's going to make a difference in a lot of things, not just whether you have to accept Section 8. Right, right. Very good. Very good. And so that's, you know, that's, that's what we hear from a lot of our property management clients, you know, the amount of work that they have to do. I mean, you just mentioned a couple of examples of things that are in the pipeline for, for potential legislation and you know, so every property management company has to make sure that they understand. And uh, if they don't have legal counsel to, to make sure that they do understand what's required of their, their state or their, their local city or, or whatever. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. So let's look at a, a specific scenario now, um, get your, your comments on this. So when a landlord can't refuse to consider an application from section eight housing choice voucher holder, how should they conduct income screening of a voucher holder? Interesting scenario there. Sure, sure. Um, most, most housing providers do have an income level that they require um, to be a successful applicant, whether it's a, a maximum income um, in a tax credit property or more, more commonly a minimum income so they have some assurances that you'll pay the rent. When source of income is protected, or if you work on a federally assisted property where you must accept Section 8 vouchers, the qualification of income is a little bit different um, in that what you're looking at to qualify somebody is the tenant paid portion of the rent. So you need to know how much, of, how much rental assistance the applicant is going to get, number one. And number two, what's the difference between that amount of rental assistance and the market rent that you're charging um, for, for the particular housing? So for instance, if the rent is $1,000 a month and somebody has a Section 8 voucher that typically will pay, um, will, will require the, the holder of the voucher to pay 30% of their income, um, and which usually works out to 30% of the housing cost. Mm -hmm. So um, the tenant paid portion on a thousand dollar apartment with the typical section eight voucher is probably around $300. So that is the amount that you would use to qualify. That's the amount of rent that you would use to qualify a section eight applicant. And so if your requirement is that they have three times, um, the, the monthly rent, to uh, qualify, then they would have to have three times the tenant paid portion, which is $300 or $900 right. a month in income. Okay. 
All right. Very good. Thank you for that. Nice example. And appreciate your, your um, explanation of it. So you know, I, it, it's interesting to, to hear, uh, you know, besides the Federal Fair Housing Act, and, you know, we have different state laws and local laws. And it's intriguing that that's where it's, it, it begins. And, and, and then federal legislation at, at times kind of picks up the pace afterwards. So what, what makes, you know, income so unique? Why are so many like local governments uh, focusing on protecting that, that category? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I think um, there's been a big push in the last five to 10 years, particularly on the part of local governments to add source of income as a protected class. Um, mm -hmm. You know, 30 years ago, it may have been protected in one or two states. Um, but really within the last few years, we've, we've had California is a big one. I mean, the entire mm -hmm. state of California now, um, the Section 8 program is mandatory because source of income is a protected class under California state law. Um, and, and there's a lot more states now and in even more localities. And so it's, it's so important to dig down below the state level to your actual county or city ordinances. Why is that? I think a lot of it has to do with housing affordability and housing availability. Um, a Section 8 voucher, the Section 8 program is a wonderful subsidy program for people who um, are having difficulty paying for housing and need to obtain safe and sanitary housing. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a great opportunity. Um, the problem is if, if no housing providers will accept the vouchers, there is you know, little opportunity for, you know, to establish um, safe housing. So um, if the Section 8 program becomes mandatory because of, a, of the inclusion of sources of income as a protected class, there will be that many more opportunities for people to, to uh, branch out and, and move to better neighborhoods, better schools, and just in general, move up in life. Um, so mm -hmm. I think it's, uh, um, that's, I think, the motivation behind most of the um, the, the local ordinances and, and the state laws that are uh, adding source of income yeah. is to provide that housing mobility for people. That's, that's wonderful. That's, that's so, that's very, very cool to hear. And I, I appreciate that explanation. Yeah. It's like, it's such a, uh, it's at the heart and soul and the principles behind the, the fair housing act is right. equality. Right. So. Uh, and freedom of choice. I mean, having, right. having the ability to live where you want to live, um, if you can afford it. And if right. you have rental assistance, you can afford a lot more than if you, if your rental assistance weren't accepted. So. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. So, oh, man, I, I learned a lot. I thank you so much, Terry. This has been a, an awesome conversation. So uh, appreciate all of your, your awesome, your fantastic <laughs> explanations of what source of income is and how it affects uh, so many property management companies across our country. Okay, Terry, so we're at the point now where we're going to ask you our fast five questions and you need to answer them in under one minute. And if you can do that, you're going to get a, a herd of unicorns, you know, not just one unicorn. We'll give you a herd of wow. unicorns and one quintillion, quintillion dollars. But anyway, this is our fun component. We love it. So um, I got five Big questions. Big challenge for, for lawyers, you know, to answer <laughs> questions quickly. All right. Yeah. I'm ready. So. Not uh, uh, not easy questions whatsoever, but we appreciate it. It's a, it's a fun part. So let me get my stopwatch ready here, and then we will ask our fast five questions. Okay. Can I limit use of amenities by people who pay with rental assistance? Of course not, if source of income is a protected class. Is a preferred employer program a problem under the Fair Housing Act? It's not a problem under the Fair Housing Act because the Fair Housing Act doesn't protect source of income. It would be a problem if source of income is a protected class. Can I still check credit and rental history on an applicant using a rental assistance? Absolutely. 
do I have to permit cosigners if source of income is a protected class? No, you don't. If you don't allow cosigners normally, you don't have to just because source of income is protected. Remember, it's a protection for the source of the income, not the amount. Can I insist an applicant have employment income? Um, under source of income, no, of course you couldn't because it's any lawful source of income. Under the Fair Housing Act, though, you probably also couldn't because there are plenty of people with disabilities maybe who don't work and would have income that is not wage income, but could be considered to qualify them. So close, Terry. So oh, close. No. That, that was really, really good, though. So a minute, <laughs> a minute 13. OK, so that that's absolutely amazing. So sorry. Um, next time we'll get you those unicorns, but you know, maybe. All right. Maybe they'll show up anyway. I don't know. Wait, we don't. They show up in our dreams. At the very least, that's where they show up. So that's what's cool. Okay. So very, that was awesome. Very, very cool. Appreciate you, you. You're, you're having fun with us here today. Thank you so much for, for being available for this show. We are so grateful with your years of expertise and experience that you bring to the table, that you can share a few things with our audience today and our, our fair housing community. So can you tell us a little bit about your firm and, and how people can connect with you? Sure, sure. Baker Donaldson is a national law firm. We have uh, over 19 offices nationwide. And if you have any, uh, we, we obviously multi, um, multi subjects, uh, multi purpose law firm, but uh, I have a practice in fair housing defense and accessibility. And if you have any questions on anything having to do with that or having to do with source of income discrimination, I'd be more than happy to talk to anybody. Um, my email address is tkite. T-K-I-T-A-Y at Baker Donaldson, Baker Donaldson, D-O-N-E-L-S-O-N.com. Love to hear from you. Very good. Thank you so much. And we'll definitely mm -hmm. put a link to the website um, in, in our show notes so people can check out more about the firm. So again, thank you so much. And thank you everyone Thanks for tuning for in. To, yeah. Thank you for, for being here, Terry. Um, and thank you for, uh, for our community. You know, as always, we are Boy, we just are so grateful for all of you. Um, we, we receive constant, you know, little emails and people filling out things on the website, how much they appreciate this show, how you use this show for, for training and like with awesome interviews like we had with Terry today. And it, it's just, we, we can never take for granted the amount of education that we need on this topic. So thank you for being there. If you find this of value, please share it with your network. Uh, please subscribe to our newsletter and to our YouTube channel. And if you have any questions, keep in mind that on a regular basis, we do an episode, which is coming up very soon, where we address your questions. So on our YouTube channel, for any episode that we published, please post your question, and we'll take note of that, and it will be answered on a future episode. So thank you again. Remember, if you have any questions or topics or of any kind, feel free to reach us at, uh, or DM us. We'll be happy to consider those topics for a future show. So thank you for being here. Until next time, take care. We'll see you all soon.